So the jig is up, AMPTP. We stand tall. You have to wake up and smell the coffee. We are labor and we stand tall and we demand respect and to be honored for our contribution. You share the wealth because you cannot exist without us. On May 2nd, 2023, the Writers Guild of America, which represents over 11,000 screenwriters, went on strike over ongoing labor disputes with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, AMPTP, the group that represents the studios and the powers that be in Hollywood. The strike immediately halted live late night TV and caused the postponement of virtually every major movie and television show currently in production in Hollywood. Weeks later, after failing to reach an agreement on a new labor deal with the Hollywood studios, SAG-AFTRA, the Screen Actors Guild and American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, joined the WGA on strike on Friday, July 14th. Both groups continue to hold the line. And what happens when you take away our entertainment and piss off a group of the most well-known and famous people in the country? A flurry of renewed interest in labor organizing and unions. At a time when wage stagnation and inflation are hurting a vast swath of the population, and when our collective awareness of income inequality is more acute than ever. What happens is you have a recipe for a movement. This is how labor movements will save America. Roll the intro. Thank you to my partner on today's video. You know them, you love them, Factor. When I'm looking at a meal service, it has to have two things. It needs to be easy and it needs to be delicious. Factor delivers on both fronts, which is why I keep working with them. And boy, howdy y'all, it is 96 degrees in Minneapolis right now. I do not want to cook or prep or turn on an oven or even stand in my kitchen at all for that matter. Nor do I want to leave the AC to search for food. No ma'am, and I don't have to, thanks to Factor. They offer fresh, never frozen meals that are shipped directly to your doorstep. You just pop them in the microwave for two minutes and bam, fresh, delicious meals ready for you with no prep and no mess. I love this. I recently tried their garlic mushroom chicken thighs for the first time and it was so good. And I've been getting factor meals for months and there's still so many recipes I haven't tried. They have over 34 weekly dietitian approved meals to choose from. And get this, factor offsets 100% of their delivery emissions, sources 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices, and features sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. So what are you waiting for? Get your first Factor Box today. And head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code LEGIA50 to get 50% off your first Factor Box. Thanks, Factor. Among WGA and SAG-AFTRA's complaints include streaming platforms that substantially undercut performers' residual income. Oh my God, I'm about to be so rich. <laughs> and you got time. What? increased inflation, making it harder for them to make ends meet. 95% of the actors in SAG cannot make a living from acting. They've got to have side hustles, etc. I am one of those actors. And the existential risk that AI poses, both to writers who could be replaced by AI and by actors, especially background and extras actors, who have been propositioned by studios to have their likeness scanned for a one-time fee so that studios can then use their face in perpetuity without having to pay them every time. And a number of people seem confused about how the film and television industry works, thinking that actors and writers that are striking are millionaires seeking to hoard more wealth for themselves. And while some of the actors striking in solidarity are millionaires, the goal is not for those few at the top to get more money. The goal is for the working actors, the ones who work for weeks or months at a time on shows as secondary characters or extras, and writers who work what essentially amounts to gig work on shows that only schedule eight or 12 episodes per season. And those actors and writers who, despite all this work on the shows that we know and love, are working side jobs as baristas or bartenders to make ends meet. Those are the people who are getting hurt the most by inflation, streaming platforms, and AI. This despite the fact that overall production and writing budgets have ballooned. See the recent HBO snafu The Idol, whose production budget was $75 million. Or the recent Batgirl movie that cost $90 million to make, but was scrapped at the last minute. Meanwhile, studios are claiming they can't meet WG demands for an extra $429 million, which would amount to about $50 million when split between the eight major studios and streaming platforms. For context and comparison, Warner Brothers, the producer of the 
that ill-fated Batgirl movie made $12.2 billion in revenue in 2020. Their share of $50 million would amount to 0.4% of their 2020 annual revenue. The CEO of Warner Brothers, David Zaslav, made $37.7 million that year. Despite this, WGA and SAG-AFTRA claim studios are absolutely stonewalling them on all of their demands. Despite a decline for several decades in labor organizing, the U.S. has a strong history of unionizing, and it's history that more and more people, especially younger generations, are starting to wake up to, especially since the pandemic has exacerbated and made all the more obvious the dramatic wealth gap in America. But the wealth gap hasn't always been so huge, and unions were once a central player in the U.S. labor market. The start of the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s saw a move away from rural agriculture and into the rapidly industrializing cities where more and more people began working in factories, laboring for a wage for a company. The 1870 census revealed that, for the first time, the majority of American men were working for someone else. And it's wild to think that that wasn't always the case. The labor union movement started as a result of these monumental shifts in how Americans were living and working. Workers were seeing their bosses get rich while they toiled for long hours and received low wages. By the late 1800s, the average American worker logged 100 hours of work per week. The largest labor movement in history came in 1894, when socialist and union organizer Eugene V. Debs, who would later be the first and only person to run for president from prison for now, well, in 1894, he organized a strike of Pullman Railroad workers, which, similar to the threatened UPS strike, brought the nascent railroad industry to its knees and signaled the strength of labor organizing and unions in America. A few years later, in 1909, the uprising of the 20,000 saw female shirtwaist makers in New York strike for safer working conditions and higher pay. Two years later, 146 workers would die in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Many of the commonly accepted labor laws we have today are a result of labor organizing, like the five-day work week, the eight-hour work day, restrictions on child labor, and the minimum wage. By 1935, the National Labor Relations Act passed, protecting employees in private sector workplaces, giving them the right to seek better working conditions, union representation, collective bargaining, and full freedom of association without fear of retaliation. The act also created the National Labor Relations Board, the entity tasked with investigating anti-union behavior and other violations of the NLRA. Throughout the 20th century, the popularity of unions was dependent upon the economic and social climate of the time. During the First World War and the decade that followed, unions were discouraged, first because labor strikes during war are seen as unpatriotic, and second because of the economic boom of the 1920s. Then came the Great Depression and an increased interest in labor organizing as income gaps widened. Then came World War II, during which some workers were even forbidden from striking because of the imperative to continue wartime production. Soon after came the Cold War and the Red Scare, which brought with it a monumental pushback against unions because of their strong association with socialism. By 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act required all union officials to file an affidavit and take an oath saying that they were not communists. This fear of socialism and communism continued through the economic process prosperity of the 1950s. Then came the 1960s, and with it a growing social movement, especially among Black and Latina workers, including a 46-day strike at seven New York City hospitals. Workplace safety and civil rights were the impetus behind surging union memberships in the 1960s, led especially by Black and Latina workers. Martin Luther King Jr. was in Memphis to support a strike led by Black sanitation workers when he was assassinated in 1968. Despite this resurgence in the 1960s, by the 1970s, union membership began to decline. Historians point to a number of reasons. First, companies began moving industrial jobs to the South, where there were fewer unions, and then eventually overseas, where they could find people willing to work for less pay and without unions. This shifted the available work from industrial and manufacturing jobs to service industry jobs that didn't historically rely on union membership, and that were often association with soft work, work for women, whose jobs were seen as milk money jobs, as opposed to serious industry worth organizing. Stagflation in the 1970s also led to an increase in unemployment, and employers began hiring anti-union consulting firms at a higher rate. Oh yeah, there's an entire industry built around union busting, but we'll get into that. This gradual decline was supercharged by none other than Ronnie Reagan, because of course. 
Despite using his past role as president of the Screen Actors Guild as part of his platform while running for office, Ol' Ron as president was focused on kowtowing to his big billionaire buddies and staying in the good graces of big business. So when PATCO, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Association, went on strike in 1981, Mr. Ronnie R. forgot his union sympathies and immediately took advantage of a never-enforced federal law that barred federal employees from striking. But I must tell those who fail to report for duty th this morning, they are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. Two days later, he fired 11,000 striking air traffic controllers and barred them from ever working for the federal government again. It took 10 years for staffing levels to return to normal. According to historian Joseph McCartan, prior to the PATCO strike, there was a universal understanding that employers shouldn't fire their striking workers, even though it technically was legal. Before Reagan, firing your striking workers was seen as reputational suicide. But once the federal government broke this unspoken rule of decorum, all bets were off. It sent a strong message to the private sector that prior rules of decorum when it came to labor organizing, long held out as an important part of the functioning of American capitalism, no longer applied. And once an unspoken rule like that is broken, it's hard to ever go back. Soon, major corporations like Hormel, Phelps, Dodge, and International Paper simply hired replacement workers when their workforce held strikes, forcing major union concessions. It sent a strong message to unionists that they no longer held the power they once did. The year before the PATCO strike, there were 300 major labor strikes. By the 2010s, there was an average of just 16 labor strikes per year. Union membership, which hit a high in the 1950s and 60s, fell from 35% of the nation's workforce to just 10% today. And historian Joseph McCartan draws a stark picture of the long-lasting impact of the decline of unions in America today, saying that the decline in union membership disabled what was once a vital instrument for building and maintaining social solidarity and for directing inevitable class tensions and social conflict towards democratic and egalitarian ends. And this lack of outlet for maintaining class solidarity created a power vacuum that allowed for racial division to run rampant in this country, encouraging white supremacy and enabling an environment in which the January 6th insurrection was possible. On the flip side, based on what we've learned in my past videos about white nationalism and the religious right, there was likely a backlash by whites against labor organizing across racial lines after the civil rights movement, because it challenged the notion of America as a white Christian nation in ways that white Christian nationalists still haven't gotten over. So the decline in union membership and collective labor organizing based on class solidarity could have, in part, been caused by white supremacy, while also then allowing white supremacy to proliferate in its absence. I feel like a whole thesis could be written on this. Anyway, that brings us to today. As evidenced by not only the current WGA and SAG after strike, but also by the unionization efforts across the country in Amazon warehouses, Starbucks coffee shops, and even strip clubs, union membership has increased since the pandemic. A recent Gallup poll showed that 71% of Americans support unions, the highest level of support since 1965 during the height of the civil rights movement. And as is the case throughout the history of union organizing in the United States, the current opinion on labor organizing is understandable when you take a step back and look at what's on folding around us. The global pandemic gave us all the existential crisis and the space and time to take a step back and realize what really matters to us in this life. And it turns out it's not our stupid fucking nine to five jobs. Turns out that for many people, building a career is largely a lie they've been told in order to get them to trade their precious and few hours in the day in exchange for not enough compensation while 1% of the population gets absolutely stinking fucking rich. And COVID relief checks and unemployment gave workers, for the first time, a tiny bit of bargaining power. They no longer had to stay and put up with low-wage jobs with awful employers and no rights. They could afford to stay home and look for better employment elsewhere. We watched as workers who were deemed essential were also underpaid, treated like trash, and forced to literally risk their lives to keep us alive or fed or to teach our children. And as millions of people were laid off during the pandemic, it became apparent that workers with the protection of a union were being laid off at a lower rate and often with job or paycheck guarantees. And all the while, billionaires like Jeff Bezos profited from the pandemic, built dick-shaped rockets to yeet themselves into space for fun and had a nice chuckle while we were all fighting for our fucking lives down here. 
Public perception has turned against the ultra-wealthy, and awareness of the class struggle is stronger than ever. And regaining that class consciousness has been made all the more powerful and widespread thanks to social media, especially the concurrent growth of TikTok along with the pandemic. The great resignation of the last couple years has been spurred on in part by the collective understanding that we deserve better. And the growth of remote work means we have a better chance of finding better work no matter where we live, meaning we're less beholden to major companies, especially in towns and cities where historically one or two major companies have served as the sole employers in town. So you take that collective class consciousness, awareness of the wealth gap and the insidious way that capitalism allows 1% of the population to unfairly benefit from the labor of millions, and you combine that with an environment where it's easier than ever to quit your job and find work elsewhere, and everyone is sick and tired of being burnt out and overworked, and you have a recipe for a dramatic increase in labor organizing. And that's exactly what we've seen. But that doesn't mean it's been all sunshine and roses and we've all stood around holding hands and saying kumbaya and egalitarian class solidarity. No, no. Companies have always had their tactics to undermine labor organizing, and those tactics are alive and well, my friends. An excellent example of these tactics in action is the recent union movement in Starbucks stores and the company's response to said movement. Unionizing efforts at Starbucks began in earnest in 2021, and according to union organizers, from that point on, it has been nonstop corporate presence and interference in this campaign. Starbucks, for its part, of course denies that they're anti-union, saying, we just don't believe a union is necessary at Starbucks. Well, my dude, your employees believe a union is necessary at Starbucks. So clearly one is necessary. Otherwise your workers would feel heard, happy, adequately compensated and comfortable coming to you with their concerns. And you can tell the power of unions and how unions can make major corporations quake in their fucking boots because in response to unionizing efforts, Starbucks sent corporate executives, including the CEO of the company, to organizing stores in Buffalo, New York, claiming he was just there by coincidence and they were there to help. You know a company's scared when it's sending a CEO somewhere to talk to the lowly customer service workers. Ew! Unions are powerful. But protections for unions were stripped away during the 20th century, while laws and policies were put in place that favored big corporations over unions. Today, laws protecting unions are laughably weak and provide little actual protection or punishment for union busting. Under the law, you have the right to talk to your coworkers about pay and about unionizing. And employers cannot interrogate, surveil, threaten, or retaliate against employees for their unionizing efforts. However, they are allowed to share their thoughts, predictions, and opinions about unionizing with employees. So they can't say, if you unionize, we'll cut your health benefits. But they can say, if you unionize, I don't know what your health benefits will look like. Which is pretty much the same thing, and anyone who says otherwise is being willfully idiotic. And even if an employer does retaliate, surveil, threaten, or interrogate employees for their unionizing activities, the punishments are meager if the company ever gets caught. And the numbers are staggering. Employers are charged with violating federal law in 41.5% of all union election campaigns. Nearly half. And that's just the ones who are charged. See, the NLRB is the board responsible for enforcing the NLRA and punishing companies for their misdeeds. The NLRB's funding hasn't budged in nine years, and the agency is so bombarded with complaints and so underfunded that it isn't possible for it to respond appropriately to every complaint submitted. And even if they do respond appropriately and find that a company has violated federal law, the worst thing that can happen is that the company gets a verbal reprimand and are forced to promise they'll never do it again and to rehire hire an employee and offer back pay to that employee, minus any income the employee made after they were unjustly fired. So of course, companies are willing to covertly and oftentimes overtly violate the law because it makes good business sense to make that business decision that violating your workers' rights is economically a more viable option than letting them unionize. And companies have been at this for decades, so they've developed a number of tactics to employ the four Ds of union busting. Divide, delay, distract, and demoralize. And allegedly, according to organizers, Starbucks has employed every tactic in the well-worn union busting playbook. Here are some of the most common. Targeting the organizing employees by changing their job description to include impossibly hard tasks, tasks meant to be done by more than one person, or tasks that cannot be completed in the time period given, as a pretext for firing that employee. Firing employees for violating previously unenforced rules or based on a technicality that no one had previously been fired for. Papering the walls of employee break rooms and restrooms with anti-union flyers. Holding captive meetings during work hours that employees are required to attend, during which the company shares their predictions and opinions about labor unions. 
sending anti-union text message campaigns to employees at all hours, killing movement momentum by delaying as much as possible through frivolous complaints and other legal means to gum up the administrative process. And what's fun is that companies don't even have to do this themselves. Commonly, companies will hire union-busting firms that come in and do all of this for them. And in addition to these tactics, companies love to vilify unions to their workers. Robert Reich recently debunked a number of myths that companies love to tell about unions. Here's a few. Myth number one, labor unions are bad for workers. In actuality, when more people unionize, labor trends change for the better for all workers, even those who aren't unionized. For example, in the 1950s, one third of employees belonged to unions, and this bargaining power meant that wages continued to rise with inflation. The death of unions was bad for all workers. Myth number two, unions hurt the economy. In actuality, when workers are unionized, they receive higher wages, which spreads economic gains more evenly and supports the middle class, allowing workers to spend more money and causing business to thrive and the economy to grow. Without unions, the money doesn't trickle down to workers. It coagulates at the very top. In 2018, the weekly median income of unionized service workers was $802, while non-unionized service workers earned $541, a difference of $13,572 per year. But businesses will also say that unions are just trying to take your money to line their pockets. But the yearly $700 in union dues, when compared to the $13,000 extra dollars you could earn on average per year, Seems like a fair price. Myth number three, unions don't have your interests at heart. They're just as powerful as any big business. In actuality, big businesses, of course, much more influential and powerful than labor unions, with Fortune 500 companies accounting for three-fourths of the total US GDP in 2017. In the 2019 midterm elections, labor unions contributed $69 million to political campaigns, while big businesses contributed $1.6 billion. Overall, what's been proven time and again for over a century is that unions are good for workers and at most an inconvenience for employers. And I posit that labor organizing may hold the key to our salvation as a nation. Okay, maybe that's a little too rosy or dramatic, but let me explain. In a capitalist society, lack of access to capital means lack of access to power in every sense of the term. This is not a difficult economic concept to understand. But for centuries, even through the major labor organizing movements of the 20th century, we have been divided as a nation along racial lines to such a degree that we put our race and our racism above our economic status such that we're willing to work contrary to our own economic interests if it means keeping these racial lines intact. Indeed, the concept of white versus black was created as a means of dividing the lower classes, making white people feel superior to black people, at the expense of the power that could come from scrapping racial lines and organizing as a social class instead. Labor organizing allows for just that, when done right. Additionally, as we learned in some of my past videos, the last century has led to a deep divide along political lines in this country, to the point that Democrats and Republicans lead drastic drastically different lives, from where they work and live to the establishments they frequent, and each party has been othered to such an extent that we literally cannot fathom believing in what the other side believes. But union support isn't easily divided along partisan lines, because there are working class folks in both parties who have historically benefited from union membership and who have understood the power that comes from labor organizing. And while the solutions that Democrats and Republicans believe in are drastically different, I think in all my research into how Republicans think, one thing that stuck out as a major unifying force is that we all, Democrats and Republicans, black and white, feel incredibly taken advantage of and that despite all of our hard work, we can't get ahead. And meanwhile, we watch millionaires and billionaires in government and in big business make decisions that are contrary to our well-being in every single way, from the air we breathe to the use of the taxes being taken from our paychecks. We watch as our representatives play the stock market and our judges fly in private jets and billionaires literally fuck off to space while our dollar is able to buy less and less at the grocery store. When you step back and look at it as a whole, the answer is pretty clear. We have more common interests than I think either side wants to admit. And organizing our labor and equalizing the power between laborers and big business could make many of those common interests come to fruition and maybe even heal some of the brokenness we're experiencing in mass in this country. But it would take a major ego check from both sides. It would require Democrats to stop demonizing Republicans as gay-hating, gun-slinging, uneducated hillbillies and recognize the humanity and common interests in working-class Republicans and our shared struggles. It would take Republicans setting aside their everyone-for-themselves mentality and recognizing that when one group of laborers wins, we all win. It would require them to see the humanity in Democrats, yes, even the trans ones and the black ones. 
our division only hurts us in the long run. The only people who win while we're all down here duking it out over culture wars and wedge issues are the 1% who sit atop their pile of money and do not give a shit about us. That is until we start organizing. Then you have millionaire CEOs visiting Starbucks stores in Buffalo, New York, talking to the lowly customer service scum and quaking in their fucking boots. And that's not to say culture wars and wedge issues aren't important. I have a whole literal goddamn channel dedicated to them, so don't come for me. But the reason our divisions have gotten so strong in this country is, I think, in part, because we literally don't speak to each other. Hearts and minds aren't always changeable, but interacting with the enemy on an equal playing field and working towards a common goal forces you to see that they're just humans trying to exist in the world in the way that makes the most sense to them. And it may be a crackpot, starry-eyed, unrealistic dream to think that we could ever mend our infighting through labor organizing, but man, someone's gotta dream big in this current climate and I suppose it might as well be me. I know, it's out of character, but here we are. So what can you do? How can you get involved in my wild and unhinged scheme to save America through labor organizing? I'm so glad you asked. First, you can join a union or start a union where you work. Thousands of people organize unions every year all across the country and in all kinds of jobs. The AFL-CIO is a great place to start if your industry doesn't have a specific union. They can help you get in contact with a union organizer and teach you the steps it takes to organize a union. Don't cross the picket line. Stand with unions when they strike by not crossing their picket lines. This means letting companies know that unless they end their dispute with their employees, there will be no business as usual. This means participating in boycotts, joining picket lines, and refusing to do business with companies whose workers are striking. You can become a union organizer or work for a union. The AFL-CIO, a collective of 60 labor unions, has tons of job listings right now and even offers three-day labor organizing trainings. And you can support legislation that strengthens union rights. The PRO Act, or Protecting the Right to Organize Act would hold employers accountable for violating worker rights by authorizing actual monetary penalties and closing loopholes for employers. It would strengthen support for workers who suffer retaliation for exercising their rights and give workers the right to sue companies privately for violating their rights. And it would prevent employers from interfering in union elections and prohibit captive audience meetings. The PRO Act has been introduced three times in Congress. First, in 2019, the bill passed in the House and died in committee in the Senate. In 2021, it again passed in the House and died in committee in the Senate. The bill was introduced for a third time in February of this year in both the House and the Senate. It has since been referred to the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. And in the Senate, it passed the committee and was ordered to be placed on the Senate calendar. So now you need to call your representatives, both in the House and the Senate, and especially if they sit in the House Committee on Education and the Workforce. Minnesotans Ilhan Omar sits on that committee. And tell them you're a constituent and you strongly support the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. That's HR 20 in the House and S 567 in the Senate. Call them, email them, and send them a written letter. What's cool is that most people never contact their representatives. So if you do in three different ways about the same issue, it makes your voice so much louder. I've included a script below that you can use when you contact your representatives because I also am terrified of calling people on the phone. But please remember that your representatives work for you. It doesn't often feel like that usually, but that is technically the gig. Host a party, invite your friends over, give them information about the PRO Act, along with the script, the phone numbers, the email addresses, and some pre-addressed envelopes and papers with stamps, and play some fun music, hand out snacks, have everyone contact your representatives together. Post on social media about it and encourage your friends to do the same. Be persistent, be annoying, be the thorn in the side of your representative if they're not doing what you want. I know it can be fucking annoying to be told over and over again to contact your representative Representatives. And it's not the singular solution, but it should be part of a larger strategy for strengthening the labor movement. And finally, hit that like button and share this video with a friend. Knowledge and education is the first step to power. If you like this video, you'll probably also like my last video all about how the religious right ruined everything. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, including my newest patrons, and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum patron, Brett Piantek. If you're interested in behind the scenes content, access to my research and show notes, content about my dog, and all sorts of other stuff, consider joining me over on Patreon today. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.